I'm here with Richard Bartlett, and as an Australian, I'm um, legally obligated by the Australian government to uh, give you shit, you Kiwi. So um, how about those sheep or, or the hobbits or the picturesque mountain ranges? And uh, also something, your sports are not as good as our sports. No, our sports oh, people sorry, maybe are better than your sports. I'm not really sure how to do this. published an article for uh, C4SS, which I am related to, talking about activism and your experience with democracy and alternative forms of social organization. And I, I just really like to know kind of how you got started, because it was a very like informed critique of, you know, sort of an anti- anti-democratic position. And also, uh, you know, you, you, you're talking about like these fairly established movements that you brought up in the article that people don't really know about them. And you talk to people and you're like, Hey, like, what do you think of, you know, like this stuff going on in Taiwan? That's really interesting. And, you know, people had no idea. So, you know, from, from that, I kind of got like, you know, you're fairly in the midst and, you know, you're in the trenches of this sort of thing. How did you get to this place, Richard? Mm, I have a a nasty habit of doing really long introductions. So I try and do the short version. Um, Thank you. I grew up yeah, in New Zealand on a farm, so in the middle of nowhere, and in, in a church that was really like very old-fashioned fundamentalist church. Mm. Um, you know, like my entire school and community and family and everything was all within the same very strong, strictly held set of beliefs. Mm. And then yep. I came out of that um, like in my early 20s and moved to the city in Wellington, which for me was a big city, but for the rest of the world, it's very small. It's a couple yeah. hundred thousand people. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and kind of yeah left the church and left that community and then was like lost for quite a while and then eventually Mm. stumbled into the occupy movement like there was wow maybe i don't know five or six years of being of like drifting around and then found occupy and in occupy i found this thing of like i think it reminded in a way like now looking back at it i think it reminded me a little bit of church you know like Mm. as in having that that community of belonging that those people that are taking care of each other and really yep yeah, they, they like have some higher ideals and are really trying to do something meaningful and have a purpose and that, all that good stuff. But mm-hmm. unlike church, it was like extremely complex and subjective, you know, like that everyone's subjectivity was really celebrated and we're not supposed mm-hmm. to think the same thing. We're like mm-hmm. discovering how everyone has such a different perspective and can we do a good job of listening to all those different perspectives and get some kind of collective intelligence together. And that was like amazing, mm-hmm. like so amazing for me to participate in. And then, you know, Occupy was a sort of like a temporary moment. I mean, time, time really got distorted for me, but I think we were holding the camp in, in Wellington for like two months or something. And then it disintegrated. And so then it was like, okay, um, what are we going to do next? Like there was something in Occupy that felt to me like completely life-changing. And it was like the first time I think that I have, since I left this, um, you know, like my, my, my take on religion now is I think it's, it's like, kind of a cool story but not literally true that there's like literally a god there and he's literally telling us you know what we're supposed to do but i think it's good to have stories that orient our behavior and like help us um, connect with people um but since i lost that story of when i left the church i think occupy was the first time that i had a sense of hope again like i had a sense that um like yes the world is very frightening and there are lots of things going wrong and since about yeah, since the early 2000s, I've, I've, I've been more and more awake to the possibility of social collapse, you know, like I think that's a real pressing threat. Um, but because of the way Occupy formed, the fact that it was like this massively decentralized, emergent, spontaneous network of people, all like, well, at least the ones that I was in touch with, they were all just like really trying to do something pro-social and um, humanistic and constructive and, and positive. Um, And no one was kind of telling them what to do, you know, like it was this very emergent, spontaneous thing because of that form. Like that really gave me hope. It made me think like, okay, Mm. the future is scary, but also maybe unpredictable, spontaneous organization is possible. And we can have really significant positive change without anyone really having a plan for that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. 
I unfortunately haven't like had any experience with like any real activism, but I can definitely imagine. I think that like one of the strongest ways to learn something is by doing it. Um, I think that, you know, experience of a really alt- like a really radical alternative, I think that means so much, like that can, you know, be so much more convincing than any argument in a book or anything. And yeah, that definitely, from what I understand, if I'm understanding you correctly, like that's what happened to you with Occupy? Yeah, totally. And it, it, even while it was happening, I had the sense like, it was really hard for me to explain to people who weren't participating. Like I felt like this is a, this is a kind of phenomenon that you can only understand by doing it. Like that there's some, that it was in, it felt like it was in a different class from, I mean, obviously it's like if someone, like if you're playing the guitar and I don't know how to play guitar, okay. There's some part of your experience that's inaccessible to me, but this felt like it was in a different category. Like it was so different that it was transforming the participants in a way where they're kind of unrecognizable to who they were before they went through yeah yeah and so yeah Yeah, you can't really you can't really plan that right you can't really strategize ahead of time for for that to happen uh i mean no i don't i don't think you can i think i think it's more like because i i have done like um i remember when i was at university i was like part of this club and we did like uh you know this sort of retreat thing um that was like pretty intense for a couple of days and um by the end of it like we were all like so much more closer and um you know i pointed out that time i was like i don't think like you know all these like seminars and activities are actually like teaching me anything i think like what you're trying to do is like exhaust me uh and you know like constantly like pushing me out of my comfort zone and that in and of itself is actually far more impactful than the actual content that's very complex and i don't think you can plan it but i think you can create situations in which like certain things are more likely if that makes sense yeah, totally. And I mean, that's kind of my, a big part of my job these days is creating those kind of experiences with people. And, and it's pretty easy, you know, like there's actually, we talk sometimes about like social physics as in there's mm. some basic fundamental rules about um, how you put people together and you can create the conditions where they're likely to have, yeah, like a significant growth experience or they're likely to form a strong collective identity out the other side and that sort of thing. And that's like, it's quite opaque to people who don't know about it. Mm. um because you know it's kind of like the fish who doesn't know about water right it's like it's just this ubiquitous thing that's around us is other people Mm. and and if you're not a specialist you don't really notice about how those relationships are affecting you but it is quite possible to design you know like i mean in a couple of weeks i'm hosting an event where we're going to get 40 people together for four days and Mm. um, we're specifically designing the sequence like the group process so that they're more likely to form really meaningful relationships that make a difference in their yeah. life. And th- that's not random, you know, like there is some strategy in there. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, I, mm. I also bring this up because like, I think, um, you know, like this can be used in very sort of like dark ways. Like I, you know, I think like the process of cult formation and like, you know, uh, like be- joining, uh, training an army in like the army, uh, is like a similar dynamic. I, I'm pretty sure this is the case. Like, you know, like the training, the physical training you do in the army, I think like it's not actually for the purpose of making you stronger. It's for the purpose of like breaking you down. So I, I also just yeah. want to highlight, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. This sort of this is this is a tool and it can be used for like good or ill. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a super potent tool as well. And um, yeah, if you think about armies and cults, then we, we sort of know how powerful those things can be. And I, now I'm really curious about like, how do we use that, that force or that energy, that potential, mm. um, and yeah, do something positive with it, do something that actually elevates people's freedom and their agency and their compassion and, um, yeah. their wellness and their sense of meaning and purpose, all those sorts of things. And I, I believe it's possible to do that. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I think, I think, um, I think that like the word you use there, like agency, um, I think that's like a really big, I think that's like a really important part of it. I think you could probably extend like arguments around, you know, like consent and, you know, like, uh, like informed consent, um, to like these sorts of dynamics where if you're just like some lost kid who like joins a cult or joins an army, I imagine like the dynamics at play are like more like, you know, it's, it's, it's more predatory. Whereas like with your, if your sort of thing, like, you know, if you're informed of the dynamics at play, I feel like, and I, 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 this brings us, I feel like this is like really, really like 
neatly bringing us to like another interest of yours metamodernism like i feel like you know a, a positive like version of this would be one in which you know you don't just like go through this impactful experience and you fo- form these bonds with people but you also kind of understand like the dynamics at play and you can like start you know playing around with them and tinkering with them uh whereas you know in a more authoritarian setting you know you're not allowed to like touch the dials behind the curtain or whatever um and i feel like this is a really really great introduction <laughs> to metabotomanism <laughs> yeah let's see I think the path for me, like to fill in the gaps between Occupy and Metamodernism, mm, which is yeah. quite a few years, I think it's like six or seven years um, mm. for me. Um, basically, I came out of Occupy. The thing that I was most paying attention to was power, like mm. the way that you coordinate people, like mm. the most obvious way that we know about that we have the most legible examples of are hierarchies, you know, like command and control, yeah. top down, um, whether that's school or church or state or family, you know, like it's still a lot of families are really hierarchical. And then at Occupy, I had this lived experience of what happens when you coordinate people with different shapes, you know? So there was like the global network shape where you had all of these different encampments that were um, coordinated, but no, there was no obvious central node or like there was no obvious top to send down, you know, like there was no top down kind of flows. There were obviously some nodes that were more connected than others because it's a network. Mm um there's that network shape but then there's also the circle shape of like at the local level a lot of the work was happening in circles like in these general assemblies where people are sitting there and just listening to each other at length and and deliberating and trying to form some shared view of the world um and those both of those shapes the network and the circle were really just different <laughs> you know they're, they're really unfamiliar to me and had very different consequences compared to working in the, in the, in the hierarchies that i was familiar with And so I got really excited about that and um, started working on organizational design and making technology for organizations that were trying to do something other than this triangle and other than this hierarchy. And my, yeah, my intro to that was all about power because it's like in a hierarchy, what's happening is the further you are down the line, the less power you have and the more you've got to submit your agency to someone above you. Um, Whereas in a network, you're more likely to be able to exercise your freedom because there isn't an above, you know, there's no one above you. Exactly. There's um, you're going to be constrained somewhat by the people around you, but nowhere near as explicitly or obviously as in a hierarchy. So I got really excited about that. And in a way I was kind of anti hierarchy, I guess, and like anti capitalist, maybe anti patriarchy um, sort of seeing that there are these structures uh, of power that constrain people and putting those in my, in, in my sights and my focus and saying, how do we, how do we dismantle those? How do we work in a different way? And did that through practice, like through forming organizations and supporting other people's organizations and, and building technology with them and like facilitating and advising and coaching all this sort of stuff, like working really on the ground with people, not doing this from an abstract perspective and just really found the limits of it. Um, within the space of a few years really felt like this actually doesn't, it doesn't get very far because like in my view anyway, like, okay, I can be anti-capitalist because I can see that the structure of capitalism leads to a huge amount of inequality and, and oppression and injustice. Okay. So I'm anti-capitalist, but what about if the capitalism is inside of me, you know, like what if it's in my instincts and my behaviors and my reflexes? So then am I against those parts of myself? And am I like waging some kind of struggle where, um, one part of me is the good part and the other one's the bad part. Is that how that's supposed to go? Um, and, and I think that is what's happening in, in most sort of, um, yeah, like in, the, in what we think of as like social justice world, a lot of that is, is what's happening is people are kind of subconsciously fighting with internal parts of themselves, um, and consciously fighting with, people, with other people outside of them. But there's this weird sort of, um, dissonance and like, uh, I think a lot of behavior that's happening. That's not really, it's not really obviously visible that that's what's happening, but I think it's happening internally. And so metamodernism is kind of like what happens if you see that capitalism is a problem, but you believe that capitalism is inside of you or patriarchy or any other system of oppression. Like if you, if you, if you believe that the, that these systems are not literally real, like there's not literally a a physical structure called patriarchy that's out there somewhere and you can go with a literal sledgehammer and dismantle it. Um, it doesn't have, it doesn't have a physical place. Where does it live? It lives inside of us inside of all of our 
um, psychologies and our behaviors and our muscles and our, um, some potentially even in our genes to some degree, like a, an aggressive attempt to dismantle that. It's not going to get you very far. If you actually want to like, I mean, for myself, like if I want to come out of my patriarchal patterns, like punishing myself and shaming myself and telling myself that I'm a bad, you know, like what an asshole that I am. Like it doesn't actually get you very far. What gets somewhere is compassion and tenderness and curiosity and those sorts mm. of things. So Sorry, can I just, that's the can kind I of just, metamodernism that I'm interested in. Yeah. I, I, I think I just want to make a point. Um, so it sounds like sure. what you're suggesting is like these structures of oppression are uh, actually, they operate in a very like sort of networked manner. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's like an emergent property, you know, that there's all these agents, independent agents doing stuff. And one of the emergent properties of that is that we have these systems of, of injustice and oppression, but there's not someone that's like, no one designed patriarchy and said, okay, we're going to do this now and get everyone to agree. And then they amassed all the power and made people do it, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. I think it makes our reasoning a bit screwy if we treat it, yeah. if we treat it as an actual object or with a, with yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah, a physical yeah. manifestation that we can go and just dismantle. Yeah. Yeah. It also, it also like, you know, just from a, yeah, from like a purely strategic point of view, I think like the classic example of this is like Marxism, you know, like, well, I, I, not just Marxism, but like Marxism is like the most obvious because, you know, uh, it's academics, the most prominent and like, mm. you know, if you, if you actually like go and find like sincere, like you know, Marxists today who like are seriously trying to figure, th figure shit out. They'll be like, yeah, like we actually don't really know what's going on and things have changed. Uh, and you know, we don't really have good models of the world. And I think, you know, that's because they see capitalism as like, you know, this, this thing out there, as opposed to this sort of more emergent dynamic. I, I don't know if you've read any of my, like uh, any of the stuff I've published, but, um, I like that's something that you know I've not much uh, I've listened to a couple of your episodes but I haven't read many of your articles uh, yeah no I um I really want to publish this thing of like like saying that like capitalism is sort of like this metastable uh like economic situation in which like ever more energy is expended keeping things within this very like sort of tight range in which you know the system doesn't collapse, but also like it doesn't produce too much and, you know, like liberate people from having to participate in it anyway, whatever. But, um, yeah, I, I think, I think like seeing domination and power as, uh, unfortunately it, it's like unfortunate in that it means that, you know, we suddenly have a lot more work to do, but it's also fortunate in that, you know, I feel like it really, really rewards uh, sort of the organizational forms that you were talking about um, because as you were saying, like the difference between Occupy and your church was like in Occupy, like each individual was really encouraged to, you know, participate what, like give what they could and really, you know, bring their own subjectivity to the fore. And, um, you know, when you're dealing with complex systems, I think that's an essential approach to take uh because like it's it's too complicated you're never going to be able to understand all of it so you need like disparate nodes that can you know update and like sort of match the changes within the system i lost you i lost your last little bit though so give me um give me a question or a, or a hook yeah um actually so like what is the difference between metamodernism and postmodernism hmm um it's a good question because, uh, like, if someone's listening and they don't, they're not familiar with these terms. They, it, it needs explaining, um, but it's also very tempting to get lost in these abstractions that are not very interesting. But I'll try and do a little bit, little piece of it, like my understanding anyway. And I'm really not, like, I'm not book smart. Like, I don't, I don't have this stuff down. Um, but I'll try and explain it how it fits in my head anyway. So you've got like modernism being this project of science and progress and, um, you know, the triumph of reason and, um, humans are here to dominate the planet and we're going to go and do civilization until we've covered the whole place. And then we're going to take over the solar system. And, you know, there's this kind of positive story of progress. Um, and then postmodernism comes along and says, actually what you call progress from a different perspective would be called colonization. And it's only good for the people that are in a specific standpoint if you take a different standpoint you realize that actually it's um it's not progress it's negative it has all of these it's doing all these harms it's harming the planet it's harming all these other people's like um 
what we ha- what's happening in, in, in your pursuit of progress as a loss of diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's a really important, I, I see postmodernism is basically a, a criticism of modernism, just saying like, look, all the stuff that you call progress is it's not actually positive and it's not actually true. You know, like a lot of the things that you call science, they're not actually science. You know, that I really love this. Um, I saw a, a photo from an old, I think it was like a, a feminist protest in the 60s or 70s or something. And that the, the sign said, objectivity is just male subjectivity. <laughs> and I really love that concept. You know, it's like you think that you're being objective, but actually it's just a whole bunch of men who have taken their subjectivity and pretended like it's like it's perfect and it's and it's natural, you know, and that it's this kind of like manifest out of the universal laws or something like that. So there's that really useful criticism and 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 I think we absolutely need postmodernism. We need to be able to say like that the people who have been doing the science or making this kind of progress or having these philosophies or like calling the shots about what societies look like, like they have their subjectivity and they've been trying to pretend like they don't and pretend that they are kind of godlike objective actors, but they're not. And if we listen to all the other people who haven't been considered, then we realize that things that we thought were progress were not. I think that's like crucial both from the humanistic perspective and also from the perspective of ecology and just like what's happening to the physical planet. Like that's really important. But I think postmodernism is a, it's a criticism. It's not a construction. Like you can't really do much with it. And, I, and, and um, all you can do is like continuously dismantle hierarchies. When I talk about like the social justice movement, I think social justice in general, as we know it at the moment, is very, has a very strong overlap with postmodernism that it's all about criticism and it's about looking at power and looking about who's not being heard and, um, and trying to disintegrate these hierarchies, but that's all it knows how to do. And so like the reason we have this thing called cancel culture that people are worried about is because once you start making progress on dismantling a hierarchy, then you form a movement and then you like, you look at the leader, the leaderful people, the powerful people within the movement and you're like, Oh, we need to dismantle them too. And it's just like this endless process of deconstruction. Um, but it's pretty hard. It's pretty rare to hear like a constructive prescription of like, Oh, this is how school should be. You know, um, this is what justice should look like. Um, you know, like at the moment, right? Like, what are we hearing? We're hearing defund the police, but we're not hearing much about like what transformative justice actually looks like. I know there are people doing that work. I don't want to disrespect the work they're doing. I just mean like, what are the sort of memes that are being produced? What are the, the, the loudest notes that are being played at the moment? And they're deconstructive rather than constructive. And so then metamodernism is this claim or this is an, an attempt. And I think it's very, um, it's very fresh and it's really new. And I don't think it's like very solid, but I, I like the idea and it, and it attracts me is this idea that yes, postmodernism is good, but it's not the end of the story. Like we can keep going with, 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 we've had modernism and we appreciate that there's something called science and progress. Like I'm quite happy that I'm talking to you right now on a yeah, internet connection that spans the globe. And I think that's the, that's the result of modernism that did that, you know? Um, and, and I'm glad that we've got postmodernism that we can have these interesting debates about how, how unjust and how damaging it is that this internet has been produced in unfair conditions. And I want to keep going. I want to explore new territory with you. I know I want to go to a place that we haven't thought of yet, where we start to think about how would we construct a society that's actually good for all of the beings on the planet and, and produces more freedom and more, more belonging and more, you know, all that good stuff. And that's, um, that question is kind of the territory of metamodernism. It's saying like, can we, can we keep going beyond postmodernism? And, and I think like the part that I am attracted to is yes, there's this criticism of power and it's, it's merged with a, a real deep commitment to adult development, meaning, people are complex creatures and with the right conditions, they can grow and change. And that, so for instance, if, if we're interested in say sexism, there was a point where it was brought to my attention by a lot of feminists that like, Hey, some of your behavior, Rich is a problem, you know, like that the way that you show up in a conversation, uh, the way that you put your ideas or the way you listen or don't listen, like this is a manifestation of a thing called patriarchy and it's a problem. And the, the meta modern take on that is like, so what is it about me and inside of me that is, um, that has got these reflexes and these behaviors that are causing a problem. And then like, how would we actually change those behaviors in me? And to, and I, and what I hope at least is that it treats me as an important, like dignified human subject 
who is worthy of some attention and some compassion and says, Rich, you know, how are we going to help you change your behavior? And like I said, it's like uh, compassion and tenderness and curiosity is what does it. It's like having, having spaces for vulnerability and honesty and all that sort of stuff. Like that's where, that's where my behavior change comes from. And potentially if we had a critical mass of people doing that, then we're sort of like removing the fuel for the fire, if you like. It's sort of like changing the conditions so that the emergent property of this oppressive system we call patriarchy is much less dominant than it, than it has been. Mm. Yeah. First of all, I, I, so there's a line by Stuart Brand, um, we are as gods and so we might as well get good at it. I feel like that is uh, ties in with, you know, your metamodernist aspirations. <laughs> anyway... Yeah, I, I, I think um, there's an obvious contradiction, uh, you know, if, you know, you want to dismantle patriarchy, but, you know, if you respond to, like, accusations of, you know, men being too domineering or whatever by, like, just shutting them out completely and not giving them space to grow, like, I don't know if you call that patriarchal behavior, but, like, you're certainly not transcending or getting away from, like, uh, simple like punishment dynamics. Yeah. Um, I think like especially that stuff you said about vulnerability, I think like that is like really at the heart of sort of like transcending, I guess you'd say, sort of like the deconstructionist, postmodernist worldview. Um, I look at it more as in like different like complexity scales. So like I think I think the modernist worldview is like I, and I think you can track this if you like mm. look at the history of science it like derived from you know like Newtonian physics and like mechanistic clocks um which were like you know these very simple machines and these like very simple like formulas for understanding them and for this class of objects these sorts of approaches actually really worked but as you move towards more like more complex things I think like the postmodernist view uh, of like you know, taking like different perspectives uh i think that becomes even more ever more important because you know if you know anything about computational complexity um and like modeling um a big part of science is and like making predictions is like choosing what to cut out of your models and that's not a bad thing well mm. yeah I, I, like it's a necessary evil i guess you'd say and so yeah i i, I think like uh, the postmodernist view was like a very pretentious, very French, uh, <laughs> like it, it, it was a very like attempt. It was a very pretentious, very French attempt to like grapple with like the underlying fact that these approaches that work really well in one domain were running up and like just collapsing in these other domains. And then they didn't like understand it from the perspective that I understand it probably cause like, you know, computer science was uh, like a really minor thing back then. Um, but that, that's like the way I approach it. Yeah. I mean, that's familiar to me, this idea of talking in terms of stages of complexity, right? So you're saying that the modernist science is less complex than the postmodern one. And then we're like trying to make this plan yeah. to be even more complex. Like that's definitely how metamodernists frame their own perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's the um, that's the focus on adult development. Is like you your your cognitive capacity for complexity literally increases as you mature, and you can intentionally like exercise that muscle and and develop more complex ways of thinking. Um, but that doesn't just happen. You know, you know, like people actually need to be taught that they need to have um, the right kind of pedagogy to support that uh, development to happen. Yeah, I, I will say though um, this, and this goes to like your critical mass point. I will say I think like uh, one thing you can definitely say is that like um, people who have that sort of training, they are able to do things that people who don't have that sort of training just can't. Like if you understand, if you have like a rough idea of how like you know complex systems integrate with each other, you can like understand what's going on. Uh, for like certain phenomena and you know you can like i don't know gain advantage from it i guess uh, i i didn't want to use the word exploit there <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i i feel like there's sort of like i i'm really trying to avoid like words like selection uh pressure or something like that but 
I think um, I think it's like a really unappreciated fact that certain parts of our economy uh, like uh, encourage diversity and more open-minded uh, intellectualism than other parts. That, that that's like sort of a Marxist take, but also not really. Um, that like you know the underlying facts of how the economy works and like what is needed to man it create certain classes of people who can do certain things and i think i think that the modern economy the contemporary economy sorry um in many ways rewards or will increasingly reward uh meta modernist thinkers i don't think like the critical mass would need to be like you know 51 percent um i think you could do a lot more for a lot less Tell me more though about what's you know critical mass is a metaphor. So uh, unpack that metaphor a bit more for me. Like what do you, what happens after critical mass is reached? Um, so I think I think what happens is like I, I think I think these ideas like a shallow version of them will really hit popular culture, um, mm. and that's that's bad and good. You know, I think a lot of the pathologies that we see in social justice are because these very shallow I- ideas got like into the culture, and people, you know, are, are going to like abuse them and use them in self-interested ways. And I think, you know, that is part and parcel of just general popularization. So you know, like, yeah, for like every like ten people who you know like encounter this and use it to like grift or use it for like simplistic purposes like you know you get someone else who actually like takes it seriously um and that's like both good and bad like i mean like you know uh this year we saw like the largest ever like wave of protests the united states has ever seen and that is certainly something you know when you say the pop culture thing uh, uh what comes to mind is have you seen that series queer eye it's on netflix oh um no but i've heard you talk about it uh, it's so good. I think it's the most accessible and fun and entertaining uh, meta modernism I've ever seen. Uh, and it's and it's like it's five guys. They show up to your house. They spend a week with you, and they spend that week kind of doing two things. One is they just they just give you tons of attention and positive feedback um, and stuff. They give you physical stuff. Um, but the other thing is that they're they're pushing you and saying, hey, you know what's best for you and you're not doing it and you need to take responsibility and you need to lean into your discomfort and, like, we're going to support you, but you're going to have to take some uncomfortable steps. So, you know, you're going to have to talk to your estranged daughter or um, you're going to have to clean up your house or, you know, you need to sort out your diet or your exercise or something. And they'll actually, they kind of, like, surround this person with attention and what I think of as, like, nurturing, basically, you know, like that it's very compassionate and tender, but it's also trying to push them somewhere. Um, and over the course of like a 40 minute episode, which lasts for a week, you just watch this person have massive breakthroughs where they come out of dumb stuck behaviors and, and find some like additional freedom and growth. And it's all because some people came in and paid attention to them for a bit. And, and that to me is like the popular distillation of metamodernism is that people just need nurturance. They need tenderness. They need connection and belonging and like, positive reinforcement and people around them saying, I love you and I'm here with you and you've got to stop like doing that destructive behavior, you know? (laughs) And that's, that's for me, like one positive indicator to see a show like that. Like before that show, I couldn't think of a single TV or movie or anything, which was about male tenderness. You know, that was about men, men being kind and nurturing each other. I'd never seen that before. And it's awesome that there's like millions of people now that are growing up watching that. I've seen some people like call Bojack Horseman uh, a meta modern show, um, but that like I, that sort of touches on male tenderness, but it like does so from a you know a very a very dark perspective. Uh, what have you seen Bojack Horseman? Uh, not really, a couple episodes, but it kind uh, of I think it was too heavy on the irony for me. I'm much uh, more like meta moderners love irony, but I'm just like no, I'm I'm here for the earnestness. Give me that. Give me that earnestness. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of Bojack Horseman. I think it's quite good. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. Um, the, the, the reason that I wanted to ask you about the critical mass because I was just trying to check in your sort of mental model, like that. There's there's a lot of people who sort of have this view, and I wanted to check if you're one of them. That like um, things are bad, but if if we had the right combination of like strategy and luck, then we could have a some kind of transformational moment, and then things would be good. And that's mm. what the critical mass is about. Is that kind of what 
is in your head? I think in terms of like punctuated equilibria and mm. like my like aim is like a world without domination uh totally and i think i think that is very far off um i think i think we can reach like significantly better worlds with like a small minority of people who are dedicated and intelligent can like find you know exploits in the system to reach a better world um but you know i've like read enough history and i'm familiar enough with just social change in general to like be be realistic enough that i'm like you know yes there is there is the possibility that you know we could end up in a magical utopia tomorrow uh highly highly unlikely um it's probably going to take a lot of work uh and we'll probably be very uncomfortable uh and will involve a lot of like dead ends but it's it's like there are you know intermediate steps between like here and i don't know like ian banks's the culture or something that i think we can get to and i think you know uh i think we like kind of have to get to because you know there's all these like existential risks (laughs) um yeah yeah. that's the thing right um that's good i think we've got a pretty shared picture i'm just thinking about um someone i work quite a lot with ronan harrington he's another like um, someone like me who's kind of on this bridge between the social justice world and the meta modern world. Like, um, he was doing political strategy for Extinction Rebellion in the UK. So that's, you know, more on the like social justice end of the spectrum. Um, but he's also organizing meta modernist networking, sort of, you know, bringing meta modern political people together. Um, and he's got really excited about this, um, think tank called Rethink X. And oh, they yeah. did this report slash short book uh calling called rethink x uh like rethink humanity i think humanity i think yeah no 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 i read that i posted about it i was like i was like oh you know it's it's really fun when like you know normie futurists are like oh yeah you know we could like potentially have communism in 10 years yeah yeah exactly and it's it's the the normie futurism for me was like it kind of put me off at first was like oh okay so here we have here we have some typical sort of accelerationists or whatever that are like you know we just need to do more technology and things could go well but the thing that was new about it for me was like the specific framing where the first part is to say civilization as we know it is definitely over. Like that is guaranteed because of a whole convergence of lots of different factors, including like climate and ecology and waste. And, you know, like there's lots of stuff about just the physics of how we're living, the energy systems, that sort of stuff. It's like, this is not going to, this is not going to continue. And let's just take that for granted and make sure that people stop hiding from that fact. And then we've got a fork in the road. We were either going to have a breakdown and things are going to sort of like, we're going to lose hundreds of years of progress and we're going to go into like a Mad Max territory, or we're going to have a breakthrough where we're sort of like just in time that we pull together these different technologies and different, you know, social technologies as well as like technical, physical ones. And we get to this breakthrough where, yeah, there's just way more freedom. There's way, you know, like it just takes a lot less effort to meet people's basic needs and that sort of thing. I think that framing is really, really useful. And, and that, like, first of all, we have to admit that this thing that we currently know is, is over. Um, and I think people have got strong psychological defenses to prevent them from thinking that, you know, because it's scary to imagine that everything you've known and your parents and parents and parents have known is, like, not going to last for another 50 years. But then we have to hold, for me, I need to hold the door open for both the positive and the negative option. I, it's really easy for me to just kind of flick onto one and hold onto it and be like, oh, I'm a doomer, everything sucks, like there's no way we're going to get through this. Or like I get very optimistic and utopian and like, oh, yeah, there's nothing to worry about because technology, you know, and like both of those are too simplistic. But knowing that both of them are um, a legitimate option and that our behavior kind of subtly alters the probability field and that we can lean ourselves more towards the positive option, I find that quite motivating. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, cards on the table. My my opinion is like I think we're going to be somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. <laughs> you know, I, I I really really would be like I mean, Utopia would be great. It's it's also just like you know, insurance. You know, a smart investment strategy would be like okay, like you know, let's say fully automated communism is a thing. You should invest as though like that isn't going to be a thing because if it's a thing, you're going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. but like also, I don't know. Uh, I don't think like 
complete algorithmic autocracy, global algorithmic autocracy, or like collapse is a thing. I think that people have like a lot more agency than they think they do. And I think that the only yeah. reason they don't use it is because like they don't have a reason to. And so I feel like, I feel like if like shit was to go down, it wouldn't be so much like Mad Max as it would be like bizarre. Like you go to your job, but like you also have to like get water like a, you know, a feudal peasant or something. And, you know, like it, it's sort of like you're like in North Korea where like the power goes out every couple, like every hour or so. And the one guy, uh, you know, on your street who has solar panels is now suddenly like, uh, a, like a badass and everyone wants to be his friend <laughs> i think like those two binaries i think i think the reason like that you you go to them is because they're simple and because you know you you don't like have to deal with like the contingencies and like the weirdness of you know like the the fact that like nothing is ever as like cool or sexy as it is in a movie um you know like people in like you know weimar germany like even you know like radicals who were like in the street fighting probably like you know they'd, they'd like go home and they'd like you know have like dinner and maybe it was like shitty and then they'd like have to take a shit or you know like they, they, they'd, they'd like they get like letters being like oh you know like your cousin in another country is having a wedding and they'd be like oh cool i'm gonna put that in my calendar and then you know like before they went to the wedding, I don't know, like they ended up dead or something. I, I, I think that, I, I think that this is, I think again, like, I don't know, maybe this is like a meta modern critique of like art and storytelling, but I think like it's, it's really, really hard to like tell an interesting story where like all the boring, weird, mundane, annoying stuff in your life that, you know, is like just there actually gets like, uh, focused on because yeah. it's not it's not interesting it's kind of i think it's good you mentioned that as well though because the meta modern body of thought i think it starts in the art world i think that's where it kind of came from um and then i got interested when it became political meta modernism with this book the listening society by hansi freinacht um which i think it was like 2018 maybe he published that and um but but that we need these spaces like the arts for instance for really creating completely new context for different kinds of thinking to happen, different kinds of action yeah, to happen. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're kind of like very slowly might leak out into, yeah, into a very elite sort of abstract um, philosophical political spaces. I mean, elite, not in the sense of powerful, but like in the sense that we're rare, the kind of people that, that are paying attention to this stuff. Um, but that over the, over the coming years, it might leak out into much more, uh, yeah, you know, mainstream or sort of that it might have bigger reach. It might touch places like queer eye, um, it might it might reach more people like that it just you don't know where it's come from and you don't know where it's going you know it's this quite emergent somewhat yeah, random yeah, yeah. process yeah so i i will say like you also don't you know when you create art that has an impact in the world you like it doesn't have to reach many people um for example i know that um like when silicon valley in the 90s when like the internet boom was getting going people would like tell recent employees in like their you know whiz bang startup to like read um oh, what is it snow crash or like neuromancer and they're like that's our business oh, sweet. plan sweet <laughs> um so like <laughs> you don't you know um and and, and like um you know a cor corollary today is like you know again like ian banks's the culture uh you know is like a favorite book somehow of all like these tech billionaires but also you know is like a touchstone for like you know any like progressive futurist if you ask them like what would your ideal society be would you be like well you know like this scottish dude like wrote a bunch of books about like people in space getting up to crazy shenanigans <laughs> uh that'd be pretty cool <laughs> yeah it's surprising right <laughs> and it, it, it's funny i'm thinking about like how does this apply to the work that i'm doing now and in a sense i'm trying to like i'm really against the idea of um designing the utopia right i mean mm. uh yeah yeah uh, we had jahid on the show recently and um yeah, yeah, yeah. their twitter handle was like against utopia right like yeah I, I think i'm in that position too like don't don't sit here and try and design what it's going to look like but what i am trying to do is um do some 
do some R and D and see if we can isolate a few patterns that are so simple that they have a lot of mimetic potential, like patterns for basically how do you bring groups together? Like what are some, what are some patterns of organization that, um, people don't really have to go through the thought process of like, Oh, the limits of postmodernism and like how some parts of social justice movement don't work very well. Like you don't have to think about all that. You just get these patterns, you know, like, oh, okay, this is a, this is a way that you can organize. And that some of those patterns kind of put people in a posture where they're more likely to be leaning towards utopia. But I don't have a, an opinion about what that utopia utopia looks like or like what, what values need to be prioritized or like how would they, they describe their vision or anything like that. I just want to give people like cool Lego blocks, you know, that they put together yeah, in yeah, interesting yeah, ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I think, um, I think like a really like succinct way to phrase it would be like, you can't plan for utopia because it's just like, you know, if you think our current society is complex, like, you know, just wait until like everyone like has like their freedom increased by several orders of magnitude, like then you'll really be fucked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that's what's going on, right? Like that that's what that's what so much of um people's concern about this present moment is just about there's more freedom around, I think. Mm. That's how I see it. Like yeah, um, yeah, yeah. all of this concern about like um fake news and being in a post truth world. It's like, yeah, okay, partly that's information warfare and like bad actors doing stuff to manipulate us. But a lot of it is just that there's just way more people that have access to publishing now. And so we have to deal with way more perspectives than we used to have to. And that's like, it's disturbing. It's like our, our pleasant, comfortable simplicities, like those nice oversimplifications, like there's a thing called the news and it happens every day and there's a list. And like the most important thing on the news, it happens at the top at six o'clock. And then the second most important thing happens at five past six. Like that pleasant simplicity doesn't, it's not convincing anymore, you know, and we've just yeah. got to deal with the results yeah, of having yeah. way more people having way more different priorities and perspectives. Yeah, and it's uncomfortable, yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I think we're going in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think also, I think part of it is like we, um, the tools we have are like really, really shitty. <laughs> like I, I have a love hate relationship with Twitter, but in terms of like, as a tool for like determining whether something is true, Twitter is really, really shitty in terms of like what you can do to verify things uh not in that like you know twitter like assigns a bunch of people to be like truth verifiers and you know when you click on a tweet it's like this tweet has not been verified more in that you know like uh my ideal version of this would be like you know you can like assign people you can be like okay like you're my guy on like you know i don't know like 19th century france uh, and, you know, you're my guy on computers. And, you know, if you say something on computers, you can, like, you know, say, give your opinion on something and it can, like, factor into a whole bunch of opinions. And then, like, using, I don't know, like, web of trust dynamics, it gives me, like, something of a rating. Um, you know, obviously it's not perfect, but it's far better than, like, what we have now, which is, like, you know, people get retweeted and you have no idea of verifying. And, you know, there's, like, no sort of, like, chain of like processes that you can go to uh in like a decentralized manner um and that that's that's really unfortunate because like you know information warfare is like becoming a thing and it's becoming increasingly available to everyone because the tools are getting so cheap i think like the only thing that can really fight it long term is sort of like decentralized approaches that are flexible enough to keep up with um bad actors basically I have a like a, a maybe like a complementary perspective to that. So, you know, part of the background of my story that I didn't really go into is that uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Lumio, which is a, a tech platform for organizing. And what you just described was like a big part of that founding vision and that gesture of like, oh, the platforms we currently have are really terrible for lots of things. Like they optimize for the wrong stuff. What if we optimized for? Um, in, our, in our case, with Lumio was like, what if we optimize for like collective understanding, like shared understanding? bring a group to have the same view of something and yeah, what if we optimize for yeah like being able to verify information in different domains with a really massive population and I, like i don't want to discourage that that's a, like what you described as cool and someone should definitely be experimenting with that um but what i found like the reason i'm no longer building technology is because i felt like it, it invited me into a kind of cognitive trap which is like this wishful thinking that if only we had the right tool, then we wouldn't have to deal with this problem anymore. <laughs> so like, Oh, if only, if only I had this organizing platform, then it wouldn't be hard to organize anymore. 
And so like the, what I'm trying to suggest as an alternative view is like, imagine for a second that we actually don't have any control over technology that we can't like technology is just stuck. It's just, we're just, there's no changes to technology anymore. It's like, if you wanted to have better sense making on Twitter and you couldn't change the technology, how would you change your behavior? And that, I think that question is kind of accessible and generative for everyone that does it. Mm. Uh, yeah. Whereas the like, how would we design and build a different system is, is a pretty, it's pretty rare that someone's actually got the agency to do something about that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I, so I agree with you. Um, it's, it's not so much. Uh, so I think if we had better tools, like the problem wouldn't go away. It's more like, you know, I have tried to be more conscious, you know, about like my news intake from Twitter, but like, there are, you know, there is just like a limit to my capacity uh, to like remember, yeah. you know, everything and to like, you know, uh, do proper audits. And if I could like outsource that to like algorithms, so like, you know, not, not algorithms, but like if I could like, you know, tag people and be like, okay, so like you're like, I don't know, really good in this domain. And, you know, this other person, I've seen them like post all this bullshit like a bunch of times. If I could like outsource my memory to a machine in that way, I think that would make the process a lot easier. I know enough about like the problems of information verification that I don't think it'll ever go away. I think, I think like the only way you could get it to go away is through like the most totalizing awful high modernist approach that like just locks everything under like central control and is just completely unacceptable on a whole bunch of domain on like a whole bunch of levels uh so obviously we don't want that maybe it's interesting i can describe my current solution like how i'm using it with the current technology is basically like instead of thinking in terms of domains which you know like a domain's not real um, yeah, yeah. A discipline's not real, and you know yep, we talk about that, that is, interdisciplinary yep, thinking or something. Yep, so yep, yep. That's a problem, you know. So like the design of the categories is already a problem. Instead, um, I have a few people, maybe like fifty people, like a knowable list of people that I really just trust. As in, mm. I trust their character, I trust their good faith, and so on. And that I'm in, I'm in a meaningful relationship with them where we have shared context. That, that I know a little bit about where they're coming from, and they know where I'm coming from. And there's a certain amount of diversity in that group, like not mm. extreme diversity, but like I am trying to maintain these relationships with people that are say on different points of the political spectrum, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and that, 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 that forms a kind of collective intelligence that I can rely on. Um, and then, so there's like this tight, this tight sort of loop, this tight circle of people. And then there's the mass, you know, like the, the, the seething masses, the crowds of all the people. And I, I'm, I follow 5,000 people and mm -hmm. I'm intentional about, I follow anyone that triggers any reaction in me and especially the negative reactions. Like if I read something, mm -hmm. I'm like, you're an asshole. I hate you. I'll follow them. Um, or like, <laughs> I hate this. This is stupid. I'll follow them and pay more attention to the things that are like less familiar to me, I guess. And, and it's a combination where I like dr kind of drag getting all of these different perspectives. You know, like I follow a whole bunch of people that are just so different for me, like bodybuilders, you know, people that are really obsessed with image or something, which is just like not how my brain works. And it's really interesting to expose myself to these different perspectives. But then it's like taking all of those like hyper diverse perspectives and kind of filtering them through that local high trust network, which is just a bunch of people who I know who know me. That's how I do my sense making. And, I, and it feels pretty resilient. Like it feels pretty, I feel like I'm making um, better sense of the world than a lot of other people. I mean, that's a big claim, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's uh, well, I, feel. I mean, I mean, like, I mean, like you are like being self-conscious about this. So like, I'd, I'd say just like doing just like anyone who is self-conscious about this and you know, has like any sort of iterative process, you know, whereby they like try to improve, I think would do better than the uh, average. So, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, this is like stuff I haven't put like a lot of like serious thought into. And I'm sure there are like other people who have written, you know, like interesting things on, you know, plans for and also experiments with uh, these sorts of technologies. But I don't want to just like give up and, you know, just like completely. I think like, you know, maybe even if like the gains are small, I well. There's also, there's also, you know, just like the general like questions of agency and like, you know, using someone else's platform versus like using um, something that you have more control over. And, you know, even if yeah. uh, these tools uh, in practice, like 
don't do much. Uh, I'd still like, you know, to have more agency over the platform I use. I think also like uh, a more like bottom up approach to moderation, um, I think would be really nice. Uh, I, I think like a lot of people have yeah, and that, that out in the past couple of years. I don't want to discourage any experimentation. I think it's really important. And, th- and th- there's cool stuff happening as well, you know? And, and my sense is like, you really have to make a strategic choice about how far down the stack do you go. So like, mm. there's a problem with the way that we do internet at the moment, you know? And, and I think um, partly about the sort of ownership and funding of platforms and partly about the technology, about how we use servers and how we have mm. clients and servers. Like, that's a problem. And like the actual network architecture uh, lends itself towards, towards certain power structures. And so if you're going to try and design something different on the, yeah, like there's part of me that's, that says, well, you should start on a completely different stack, meaning like how you do your ownership, but also how you do your network architecture should be completely Mm. different. And then you build different features and so on. But the thing is, if you are too different, then you're not going to get anyone. You're you're not going to be able to reach anyone, you know? So you've got to sort of choose like, so when we built Lumio, we thought about like, should we make this on a, on some kind of new peer to peer technology? And we thought, mm, probably not like, probably that's not going to be accessible to people at the moment. But like, if I was starting again now, probably the obvious choice would be like, yeah, we do something peer to peer, um, because the ecosystem's more mature now. And you, so you've got to make these kind of strategic choices about where you go, but it's like, if you're going to build, like, if you're going to get like a traditional venture capital funded startup, it doesn't really matter what your cool ideas are and what you're trying to optimize Mm -hmm. for if you're venture capital funded you're just going to produce the same results every other venture capital funded project you know you're going to optimize for what your funders require and that's that's like if you're using that traditional model that's the results you're going to get so you've got to be um strategic about what kind of changes you make i think at the moment i'm still most excited about um I mean, I've got some, some here yeah, like moderate optimism for Holochain. I think they're trying to do something really ambitious and mm. I trust some of the people in the core. So that's interesting. Um, but I'm still pretty positive about Scuttlebutt and, and especially the version of Scuttlebutt called Planetary, which I just think, yeah, I think the team that's involved has kind of credibility with doing things that, are, that have mass appeal and also has a really strong critique about business as usual and it's going to do something different, I think. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, go, go, go tick people, build some cool stuff and let's see how it goes. But I just know that my, uh, my interest has moved on now. Could you, sorry, could you just explain to the audience what Scuttlebutt is? Yeah, it's, um, it's a communication protocol in the same way that the internet is a communication protocol, but instead of having clients and servers, you know, so like Twitter, there's some main sort of central place where all your data lives on Scuttlebutt your data lives on your friend's computers. That's the point. Mm. So that like, uh, it's the data is decentralized across your relationships. And for instance, if I, for some reason, my computer died and I lost all of my scuttlebutt stuff. So like, there's lots of different applications built on top of that network. So like, you've got stuff that looks a bit like Twitter. You've got stuff that looks like a blogging platform. Um, you know, there's like lots of different applications, but like if I, if my computer died and I lost all my stuff, um, I could just log back in and it would download all of my data from my friend's computers directly like that, that it doesn't have to go through some kind of um, centralized server. And and therefore it's got really different properties. You know, it means like, how do you do moderation and censorship and that sort of thing? Like, it's just different. It's just how do you do IP? You know, like uh, how do you, how do you make sure that people are not circulating content that they shouldn't be? It's really hard to do that. It's really, it's really a different problem set. And I think it, I think that architecture lends itself towards, yeah, more kind of libertarian, more, more freedom for everyone. Um, and therefore mm. there's things to like about it. And there's also some yep, yep, things that yep, make me nervous yep. about it. Yeah. Like it, like going back to our, you know, discussion on tools. Um, this is definitely a two-sided one. And, you know, you talked about the, the culture series The the original design brief for Scuttlebutt is what communication protocol would we use for an intergalactic <laughs> council? <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. literally, that's literally the design brief. It's like, you have these different civilizations that have completely different physical forms. They have, there's no way that you can synchronize them in time or in space. Like, and then occasionally they get together and they meet and they have a really important meeting. What kind of information protocol would they use? And that's, that's how Scuttlebutt is being designed. So that makes me happy. Very forward thinking. That's delightful. Yeah. And it's also, it's also helpful for, you know, like the reason they thought about that was because the, the original people live on boats which is actually like quite similar to, to being on a spaceship because, you know, you have these long periods where you're not connected and then occasionally you get together and you get to exchange data and then you move off. So it's like an offline first, 
you can use all of your apps off- offline and then occasionally you might get a data connection and, and you kind of get all the latest updates and it just magically handles all that. It's really cool. It's a really cool platform. Yeah. Have you read uh, Corey Doctorow's Walk Away? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the first part of that book was really great. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> Dude doesn't know how to write ending, endings. Oh, well. I really love the the sense of, hey, this civilization isn't working. We're just going to leave mm. and start doing something different with a different yeah. set of values. It's a bit like kind of, um, it's a bit like Burning Man in a way. You know, like what if we, yeah, no. what if we go away for a week and we just live on a different set of rules? I think that's awesome. Yeah. The bit where it yeah. lost me was this like uploading minds and like, this whole dimension was like, ugh, boring. Uh, there was some amusing like quips in it, but yeah. That thing about like living on a different set of values, especially for a short period of time. Have you read this article by David Graeber and David Wengro called, um, it's like rewriting human history or something. And it's about how like no. early. Okay. So there's like a lot of stuff in there, but, um, like one thing that really interested me, and I didn't know before I read this article was that like early people, contrary to like, you know, the notion that they were, you know, just like simple hunter gatherers actually experimented with like a diversity of social organization, organization forms. So you'd have like, these like bands of hunter gatherers in like a region who would during like the winter or something would like be, you know, in these very like small insular communities. And then they would like come together for like this massive feast over a uh, like s- short period of time. And then they would like, you know, set up like some semblance of like an authority structure. Um, and then they would like go back to, you know, being like these more decentralized, more autonomous hunter gatherers for the rest of the year. Um, mm. And I, I think, um, I think, I think there's like, you know, um, you, you were talking sort of like, you know, about how like the postmodernist critique of progress is like kind of, it, well, the postmodernist critique of modernist progress is it's kind of bullshit. And I'm inclined to agree, but I think like a good, and this is, you know, obviously very metamodern i think like a good measure of like an alternative measure of progress is like you know how many like versions of alternate societies can you like you simulate within your society like you know yeah. i think like that's something i don't know you could talk about schooling is i think that's something that's missing in our society for most people is like you don't like really get that much of an opportunity to like inhabit well like no spaces where like there's like a different set of norms that's obviously bad because like you know it gives you like all these like false assumptions about what's normal but also i think i think it's just like i think that's like a good practice to cultivate if you want to like create a society that's more like psychologically adaptable you want to like actively encourage people to be like you know, you should just like try living like, you know, some, a different way for like, you know, a month or a week or whatever. I, yeah. I, I think that's like very psychologically healthy. I, I totally I, agree. Yeah. I just imagine like if that's what schooling was, eh? like that you would, mm-hmm. um, every month, you know, you'd, you'd, your, your group of students, whatever, would be living mm-hmm. on a different set of norms. And then at mm-hmm. the end of the year, you kind of reflect on the different ways that you were making society together. And you're like, what was good about that? And what sucked? And, and use that to iteratively develop like norm, you know, like it, that's, that's a big part about increasing people's freedom is like, Hey, did you know norms exist and they're controlling you and you get to choose whether or not um, you follow them? Or if you get a, a bunch of people together, you can actually make new norms. Did you know that's possible? Cause most people don't know that's possible. Um, yeah. And like, I'm not a big fan of burning man, but the concept of like, we're going to get a bunch of people together and live a different way for a week. I think that's brilliant. And, and imagine if there was like, 50 different burning mans happening simultaneously and they all had a different set of rules and then there was a big plenary afterwards where we could, like, got to compare experiences and they'd be awesome that's what like you're actually like trying to like set up though right yeah i mean my life is already a bit like that i guess i was thinking about the spiral network that i'm in which is you know close to 200 people and from an ideological perspective they're like really high diversity but we're all like I think quite freedom loving people and trying to do stuff that involves less control and less hierarchy and more freedom. And you have lots and lots of small experiments of like, how do I make a company that reinforces my values or like that, that produces a kind of livelihood that I'm actually proud of, or like that produces, uh, you know, like economic security for people in a way that doesn't have so many negative side effects as most kinds of 
businesses do, for instance. And there's just like a lot of that prototyping happening in parallel. And so it means that w- me with my experiment, I'm less attached to the specifics of the one that I'm doing. And I'm just holding it in parallel with all these other ones and going like, oh, I can compare this and go like, okay, my one didn't work, but or like these parts of it worked really well. But I, next, next time I do an experiment, I'll recombine it with these other ones that I saw from kind of like down the hallway, as it were, from my, my other colleagues down the road who are trying other experiments. Yeah, that's that's a real uh, a huge bonus to have, like that sort of next order of scale. So it's not just me and my little crew of people, but that there are other crews around me. That really accelerates the learning process, and and I think there's so many people that are really hungry for it. You know, like there's a real meme on Twitter at the moment of people saying, um, basically, now that everyone has learned that they can do their job remotely, people are saying, I just want to move to a little village and get all of my friends to move there. Um, and, you know, like we'll start building our own society there. Like that's a really strong meme at the moment. And, mm. um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite motivated by solving some of the social physics problems that come up with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to, you, do you, you know what like an OODA loop is, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so like what it sounds to me is like sort of like, oh, you like you and your, you and your like your Inspiral tribe or whatever or like, doing like the OODA loop like paralleled uh for like living style like lifestyle or something which is <laughs> yeah that's that, it that's it that's, and, and that's and so it's amazing just, and it's not just like can we run this OODA loop and optimize our life our lifestyle mm. um but also there's another loop running which is like as we feel like our lives are becoming like i mean i don't know exactly what you're the thing that we're optimizing for i think it's like Mm. uh meaningfulness maybe yeah. and and peace and safety and generosity and these kind of things um but like once i feel like i'm making some kind of headway towards that then i start running the second order loop which is like how do we make this spread like or not just that it's spread but how do we make it spreadable so that if people want it that they can have it um so now i'm, I'm sort of in that second generation order loop now of like what are the basic starting conditions that, that help people find their way into that sort of thing Oh man, that that is really really cool. Uh, I'm quite jealous. Well, hopefully you can experiment along with me. You know, like I'm putting quite a lot of energy into making this an open source R and D yeah. project where where lots yeah. of people can, um, if they're in the right conditions, that they can start something and contribute their experience back mm. into the OODA loop. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the plug is like, I am, you know, like I'm thinking about you and. Um, and the people that you're connected to and the people that will be listening to this. And I think of, you know, like in my head, you're sort of in this category of like C4SS and these really interesting, you know, like having these conversations about market socialism and these like really far out sort of free thinking people. And I have an invitation to them, which is like, I'm doing all this work at the moment, which is about, yeah. Like how do you, how do you actually create these mutual aid networks for people that are experimenting with different lifestyles and stuff. And, and I think of that, that anarchist tradition, especially the sort of left market anarchist tradition as my spiritual home. And I really want to be making a useful contribution back to those people, even though I'm now connected to like lots of other different political tribes as well. And so I just wanted to make it clear. The invitation is like, I'm doing a lot of this work at the moment, which is like we run online courses and different kinds of training programs and stuff online. Um, and we're selling this, right? Like it's a, it's a way that I make my livelihood at the moment. But also whenever we sell something online, there's also um, somewhere in the fine print, there's a way to get it for free. You know, there's like Mm -hmm. fill in this form and you can have a scholarship if you need it. So Mm -hmm. like anyone that's doing any kind of radical organizing or radical experimentation with a different way of living that produces more just power relations, like the work that I'm doing, it's for you. So if you can't afford it, look for the fine print and just ask for the free version and we'll give it to you. That's, that's what it's there for. So I just uh, don't, don't write me off as just some grifter who's just trying to make money off anarchism. Please like take advantage of the material that we're producing and there is a free way to get it. All right. It's my anti-plug. Well, uh, all right. That, that is amazing. Yeah, everyone, you heard him. Check it out. Um, Grift, the grifters. Um, that's, that's how we'll win. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And probably the easiest way in is if you go to my website, richdecibels.com, um, that like links out all to the other projects that I'm involved in. All right, uh, man, th- this has been great. I can't, this, this hour, this hour and a, and a quarter has gone past, has gone by so quickly. Yeah. I, I really hope like, you know, we don't have a nuclear war and COVID clears up in the next couple of years. So when I come to Europe, I can hang with you. That'd be so much fun. That'd be awesome. 
I've had a real um, fun time chatting with you too. I feel like we've been exploring ideas that I haven't had before, which is my favorite thing to do.